here at the area for this Mass. And this morning when you receive, or this afternoon, when you receive communion, you'll just form a line here in the front. If you cannot kneel down or have a hard time getting back up, no problem. You just stand and you receive on the tongue standing. Oh boy, there's also others who can help you. The servers can help you to get up and down if need be. Also, remind, reminding you that we're here next Sunday, the 6th, so January 6th, the Epiphany, Feast of the Three Kings. We'll have our Mass here. So we'll see you next Sunday here at this hotel in this room, I believe. And also, um, I wanted to mention to you that next Sunday I am having the blessing of chalk, incense, and gold. So if you'd like to have any one of those items blessed in honor of our Lord and honor of the Three Kings, you may do so. And of course, the, the chalk will be available for you to mark your lintels of your doors, <coughs> your doorways, and your homes. You may do that. So just to remind you, bring next Sunday your chalk if you wish. We will have some available, but if you want to bless your own or have me bless your own, you may do so. Just bring it here with whatever gold you like. And no tax on the gold. Just bring your gold. And it can be blessed remembering that we do this in honor of our Lord because obviously the items that were brought by the three kings represent the qualities and, yes, the qualities of our Lord. So we want to honor that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Now Mary, for the grace the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Dear servers, dear faithful, on this feast of the circumcision, the octave day of Christmas, the first of January, I wish to speak to you a little bit about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Who is so small in this scene, who is ready to suffer, even in the first action that he he makes as presenting himself in the temple, the first the first, let's say yes, obey, obedience to the law was for him to be circumcised, to be made like the rest of the Hebrew nation. As we know this action, this circumcision of the child was to show that they were now part, like a baptism at that time, they were part of the chosen people of God. And he, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, will submit himself to this action. He already himself is humbled by becoming a man. God made man was certainly a very humbling act. But now humbles himself even further to the law of Moses, the law that God had given these men, these special men, these, this race from which he would draw his flesh. He will ask of this child this prescription, this law, which was what every man had to do. And yet our Lord didn't have to do that because he was not sinful. He was not just a man. Yet he wanted to appear like the rest of men. He wanted to do what the rest of men did. And so he submitted himself to this. And so what we're taught today in this Gospel of St. Luke, after eight days the circumcision of the child took place and his name was called Jesus, we see the Sacred Heart of Jesus submitting himself to the rules of men in order to win men. And not only that, that by shedding these few drops of blood, he could have redeemed all of men. But it wasn't sufficient. That was just the beginning. And he wanted to go further, even to the death of the cross, as we know, and the shedding of all of his blood from his heart. That is sufficient for him. This was not, although it would have been sufficient, a few drops of his blood, to save us all. But what he wanted to do, the Sacred Heart, is to mortify his soul, mortify himself. And that's the lesson of today. Their faithful is to be mortified. The Sacred Heart of Jesus is teaching us mortification. It doesn't matter if we're God. In that case, he was. It doesn't matter who we are. We still have to mortify ourselves. We still have to learn to turn our self-will, this desire to always seek for self and do what we want to do. We have to submit that to God's will. And so that is the primary lesson I would say of today, well at least what I want to tell you, 
is this mortification of the heart following the example of the Sacred Heart. It's so important for all of us. We cannot go through life without being mortified. There are so many things by which a man lacks mortification. Oh, I don't like this and I don't like that. Maybe it's just the way he lives or maybe it's the, the way that circumstances come to him, what he finds himself within. We don't like this, we don't like that. We're always saying that. And lack, lacking mortification of the mind, of the will, of the passions, we often hear, you need to mortify your flesh. You need to do penance. And that's good. And Holy Mother Church has a good way of reminding us about that every year, especially at Lent. And those of us who try to follow the traditional fast and abstinence on Fridays, or maybe you do the Sabbath time privilege, you follow that very strong penance. Those things do remind us that we have to mortify the flesh, but there's something even more important and it's a mortification of the soul, the mortification of our minds, the mortification of our wills, and the mortification of all of our faculties. Because what if we don't do that? Well, then are we really conforming ourselves to Him? No. We may do a lot of external practices and a lot of superficiality, but strictly speaking, we're not getting down to what He did. And only those who do what the Sacred Heart does are the ones who are saved, really. The ones who go to heaven are those who do what the Sacred Heart does. So the Sacred Heart, in the very early years, as I say, at the circumcision, is showing us that he who is God still submits himself to this rule, this law, and even in violation of his flesh, in order that he may be like the rest of us, show us that he is willing to step so low in order to bring us up. So how can we not be willing to mortify ourselves. Here are a couple words that we might attribute to the Sacred Heart, something he would say to us. It's an author's version, what he would assume the Sacred Heart would say to us. He says, Amidst all my sorrows and afflictions, the resignation of heart, his heart, to the divine good pleasure, for with my will, conformed by love to the divine will, I was ready willingly to undergo everything. Hence my joy amid suffering. For he that loves and understands the goodness of the object beloved is glad when he possesses the same. But my heart understood perfectly the excellence of the divine will. Therefore, too, it delighted to fulfill it even amid many and various sufferings. Hence the supernatural longing of my heart for suffering. Again, I, I remind you, these are the words of an author who thinks he knows what the Sacred Heart would say to us. For the true love desires to testify effectually its sincerity, tenderness, and fidelity. Therefore, my heart was forever goaded on by love, always desiring to consummate that passion which was for God and should remain for man, a manifest and ever-enduring proof of its sincerity, the tenderness, and fidelity, yea, of the excess of my love. So even now, during this time of Christmas, on this Feast of the Circumcision, our Lord is manifesting to us His love. We hear what St. Paul would say to Titus, The grace of God our Savior has appeared to all men, instructing us in order that rejecting ungodliness and worldly lusts, we may live temperately and justly and piously. So, St. Paul picks up on that and he runs with it. He knows just what our Lord said to us here in this prayer, or this writing, Hence a supernatural longing of my heart for suffering, because true love desires to testify effectually its sincerity, tenderness, and fidelity. How does a father show his love for his family? Well, by that. Sincerity, tenderness, and fidelity. How does a mother manifest her love for her children and her family? Sincerity, tenderness, and fidelity. It will be the same for the children. Not one of us is exempt from following the example of the Sacred Heart. Because it doesn't matter our vocation in life, we have to have this type of fidelity. So again, I, I ask you in this first part of the year, well now the first day, to think, okay, what is it that I do that's not mortified? What is it that's not following the Sacred Heart? And I will get rid of it. 
I will lay it aside forever. Why would I want to pick it up again? 